day. Where is the chop? Under the sponge. <laughs> thing that we'll talk about today is the curves in P2 so what we say in other words one dimensional Submanifold of P2. And after that, we will go uh, to the general, more general theory. Still some one-dimensional examples. Curves are examples, fundamental examples of one-dimensional compact manifolds. So there's a key remark here. That if you look at a polynomial in well, P2 is defined by C3, so in three variables. Polynomial three variables. This polynomial is not a function on P2C. Obviously, a general polynomial is not necessarily, let's, let's be precise, not, well, not a function on P2C. But you recall that the homogeneous, we're dealing with homogeneous coordinates and so on, so you remember this is not just the polynomials, it's a graded ring. but it's almost a function on P2. So such a polynomial is almost a function on P2. Almost. Uh, 
What's the point here? If you put in P of a factor times Z, it comes out with the degree of homogeneity here. Well, that's good because this means what we call a variety of P, which is where uh, this polynomial vanishes, is a well defined set. Well, it's a well defined subset. about equations, that's an equation. Right? And you should begin, I mean this is really naive, my granddaughter can understand this at age 11, and, and almost that, but then you should make a little bit of a, a jump and recall that uh, we should formulate this in terms of ideals, and I'm not going to write this, but, but please keep in mind you should look at somehow all the equations that define a set. Right? So that's the notion of an ideal. And everybody knows uh, from elementary algebra uh, that you look at the ideals in this ring, this polynomial ring. And then there are all of these big discussions about uh, the theory of the ring and they're finally generated. We talked at breakfast about this. But here suddenly you must go to a homoge homogeneous thing. So if you look at it, you, you need to look at homogeneous ideals. I think they're called homogeneous ideals. And this means that if, if a function is in it, then its homogeneous parts in the gradation are also in it. So you can just break it up and only look at the homogeneous parts. You can check that defines an ideal. So really what we're talking about here is homogeneous ideals. If, you're, uh, if you go to many equations, here we just have one equation. Uh, I just want to use that as a word now. Later on, it might be important. So here's just one equation. The ideal is, is this principal ideal generated by this one equation. OK, so uh, I'm still reviewing from the last. So linear polynomials would be the first thing we look at. To start drawing pictures because uh, well, at least I have to draw pictures to understand stuff. So the, the three basic polynomials here we have a basis. So well, let's use the uh, basis of the linear functions. Uh, my notation that's the basis of the linear functions, and then you should look at where they are zero and. So that's a fundamental picture I would like to draw. For me, uh, where there's zero is lines. This is z0 equal to zero. And here it is, um, maybe, I, I, I don't really ever know where. Uh, you can draw whatever picture you want, but it will more or less look like this. Why do I draw this as a line? I draw this as a line because I'm thinking it's a projective line. A typical point here, so z0 is 0. A typical point here is 0, z1, z2. Right? That's the whole line. And therefore, you have a map uh, that just takes this to its z1, z2, which is well defined because one of them is not 0 at least. To P1. And of course, this is an isomorphism in any sense of the, in every sense of the word. So and I'm every, always thinking of P1 as a line. So this is a project, what we call a projective line uh, here. Now, <coughs> the complement of this projective line here, we call the coordinate chart that is uh, 
the complement of z0 equal to 0. And this thing, as we know, is a copy by the, by the chart mapping of C2. So in that sense, P2 is a compactification of C2 by adding quite often what we call the line at infinity. And the way to think about that as being a line at infinity is, well, I'll draw some color here, is, is I think of this thing here as the origin in C2. So uh, what is that? That's, that's where uh, Z0 is not, so it's 1, 0, 0. That, I think of that as the origin. And now I'm looking at lines through the origin. You see, all these lines through the origin. I compactify each one of them at infinity here, adding one point to obtain a family of P1s going through the origin yeah, when I compactify them. Anyway, this is C2 compactified by the line at infinity. Okay? Now, there's no canonical line at infinity. I mean, you could have nothing. There are all sorts of things here. But these are somehow the standard coordinate lines, and this is the standard picture that I think most people like to draw P2. So this is the picture of P2 with the coordinate lines. So that's the linear phenomenon. All these possible lines. Uh, the quadratic form, uh, phenomena. So these things are called conics. So a conic uh, is maybe Q for quadratic form is an element of the second gradation. So <clears throat> but as you all know, any quadratic polynomial should be written as a symmetric matrix. And uh, I write this uh, because I teach engineering people sometimes. <laughs> a. Uh, ah, ah, I can even be abstract. Z, is, is Z a column vector or a row vector? Let's say it's a column vector. Right, so it's the zero set of a quadratic form. You usually use uh, a symmetric matrix. Okay, so a quadratic polynomial is exactly that. It's nothing more than a quadratic form. Uh, you know them all. And you know from uh, your first course in algebra or something, I don't know what, that the rank is the only invariant. Precisely what I'm going to say now, okay? So, <clears throat> IE. Okay. So, what does it mean, uh, only invariant? <clears throat> well, it's going to take a blackboard to explain it, so it's a, it's a big long IE. <laughs> so, the first, the first remark is that the group GL3C uh, acts uh, on. C3, and this action, by linear action, V goes to uh, V, V. And of course, this action is compatible with the equivalence relation defining projective space. So this action is this way, and that defines an action on projective space. It's completely obvious that lines are mapped to lines, so it's completely obvious that it acts, and you can check that the action is holomorphic in every sense of the word. I mean, it is, it's, it's linear. So this, this is, in fact, this is more or less, these are all, all the automorphisms, of course. But maybe you should note um, that if you take a, a very special transformation here, then, uh, well, let's do it. Uh, v goes to lambda times V is the same thing as V. So there are transformations here which don't act. The, the, 
the uh, scalars. So actually, the real the group that is acting here uh, is the group that acts, the real group that acts here is GL3C uh, modulo scalar multiplication. And this group is called PGL3. And the P here, P here means projected. Anyway, this group acts. Everybody sees it. And it's a group of biomorphic transformations. And it acts, therefore, on the induced actions on the polynomial. So the standard representation of, OK, I'll leave it at GL, GL3C, on the polynomials. So you have to do it like this. And this standard uh, representation preserves uh, the gradation. Of course, I'm just making stupid statements. I mean, obviously, if you have a homogeneous bond, I'm just plugging it. You get a home, right? I and mean, homogeneity is preserved. Scalar multiplication. Well, does it preserve homogeneity only if the rank is maximal? Or? Well, I don't know what you mean by maximum over, uh, rank. Uh, no, the transformation's in GL, so it's uh, oh, okay, yeah. it's not just an endomorphic. Yeah. If you if you if you if, yeah, you're in big big danger if you start operating with non-invertible operators. Okay, so everything's GL. Okay, <clears throat> it preserves the gradation. So so it acts on so GL three acts on. The, uh, acts on the polynomials. <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, you have the variety of P and you have the variety of B of P. <laughs> and this is a pushed around variety. I mean, you just talk about this variety and you push it around. So, come on, I mean, it's the same variety. So what we always do, really, is uh, identify these two things. Not identify, but regard them as being equivalent. So as you know, how, the, way, the way it's acting here, um, and so action on, <clears throat> on the second thing is the usual action on quadratic forms. Question, what do I mean only invariant? It says there are three orbits of GL3. Namely, if you have two quadratic forms of rank two, then there's a linear transformation that moves from one to the other. If you have rank one, then there's a linear transformation that moves from one to the other. The rank three, then moves from one to the other. So there are only three numbers here, by the way. But I, uh, so the rank <laughs> so the rank possibilities uh, are 3, 2, and 1. And you ask me what happened to 0. That is a quadratic form, but it's not allowed, of course, because it's the 0 polynomial, uh, which I've excluded. I didn't say it, but I've excluded this from the discussion, because if you have the 0 polynomial, I don't know what. Well, 0 set is the whole thing. I, <laughs> OK. Okay. So let's let's look at rank three. I take my friendly representative of rank three. This is not necessarily the best one to take, but let's take it for now. That we quite often call such things Fermat polynomials. 
Fermat curve is uh, for any, any degree here, so z0 to the n, z1 to the n, z2 to the n, so n equals 0. We call this a Fermat curve. In this case, it's just 2. By the way, this whole business about the Fermat conjecture and so on, this, this one, quadric, uh, you know triangles, right? 2 squared plus 3 squared. What is this? 25 should arrive sometimes. Yeah, 16 plus 9 is 25, and then you have a right triangle. <laughs> right? So there are lots of integral solutions to this. Okay. You, you know that problem, the, the question of integral solutions. Here there are. That's interesting. So we should understand the geometry of the Fermat curve uh, because we know, aha, uh -huh, that's interesting. Maybe the geometry behind it is playing a role in this Fermat question. Let's, let's just see. Now, I will show you my secret picture of this curve. Um, uh, it's not a secret picture, but uh, it's a quadric, so it intersects a line in two points. And uh, so these are all lines. So this is my secret picture. So let's call this curve C. And this is my secret picture. At least for these coordinate lines, it's correct, right? Because they, it intersects at two points and not in the corners. Because these corners want something like, uh, I don't know, 0, 0, 1. I don't know, it's one of these things. So it will never have a solution here. So this is a reasonable picture of, the, of such a curve. And now our exercise is to find the geometry of that curve. This curve is a smooth, uh, check it. It's, it's smooth, so you differentiate and check that it, uh, I mean, to check that it. So it's, it's smooth, you can just, you can check it in coordinates and think about, you know, check the differential of, of the coordinates, just check that it doesn't vanish anywhere on the curve. Now there's a beautiful way to understand this curve is to take a point on it and consider the set of all lines through that point. <clears throat> well, it's very clever to take the point on the curve because if you take a line through that point, then there's a unique other intersection point because the line intersects the curve in two points. Now, maybe there's not a unique one because the line could be tangent. But the line is precisely only tangent to that one point. Right? So every line determines a unique point on that, on that curve just by intersection. Okay. Well, you can check but, it. But my point means point. It's a point in, in the projective space, so it's a exactly. whole line. Yeah, in, in the projective space. Yeah, so a... so this is set, we call this the base point, P0. And, and this is a line, and the line intersects uh, the curve. Okay? At a unique point. Okay. Now, we just looked here, the set of all lines through a point is, of course, projective space. In fact, there's a mapping from this line to the projective space here. So this is, defines a mapping. This defines a mapping to P1. You understand what this mapping is? Just you map, you, map, uh, you take a line, that's, that's the point in P1. You take the intersection point, and that's the mapping to P1. And you check it. It's obviously, it's obviously biholomorphic here by algebraic, if you like. And there's some danger here. You don't know what it is somehow here, but it's certainly continuous. And then Riemann's uh, removability theorem will tell you that it extends homomorphically. So, uh, or you can make an algebraic argument for it very easily. So this thing is P1. So conic, a non-degenerate conic, defined by a rank 2 quadratic form, is P1. Okay. I mean, uh,
Okay. What were you about to say? No, I mean, what category of title one picks? So algebraic is. Okay, I'm going to need to talk about this. My arguments uh, in this course so far are very. Uh, I use everything I can use, so it's easy to see this holomorphically, and and now we we need to just start discussing algebraic category and so on. But I. I'm not quite ready to get into that, but almost. But to say, I mean, if you define everything algebraically correctly, it's an algebraic morph isomorphism. Okay. The curve is an algebraic curve. P1 is an algebraic manifold. This mapping is an algebraic morphism. Okay. Well. That's great. <laughs> it's P1. So let's, I mean, I'm not afraid to take a few cases. I'll stop doing it, but let's take the next case. <laughs> well, okay, let's take polynomial. <laughs> of degree three. Oh, well, actually, I wasn't with, uh, finished with degree uh, two, was I? I'm sorry, because, uh, I'm sorry, so where the heck am I? Uh, uh, that was, this is degree th rank three, so rank two, I'm terribly sorry, rank two. Uh, let's take this one. We're allowed to take our favorite one because everything's equivalent. And of course, we're also allowed uh, to factor this. This defines a line, and this defines a line, and so the zero set, if it's rank two, there's, these are different lines. The zero set is two, uh, two lines, so it's a reusable thing, line one and line two. That's rank two, and rank one is, these lines are the same, so it's a double line. We already see that multiplicity is, is going to play a role. So it's a line with multiplicity too. And you can really physically see these things moving as a, as a, a sphere somehow degenerating, coming in here and degenerating to two lines and so on. So you see the space of all rank three quadrants is not compact, obviously, but you let things degenerate and they degenerate to two lines, and then the two lines degenerate to a double line, and that's then a compact object, which is the space of projected of all quadratic forms. <coughs> Cubic. <coughs> I don't know the history well enough, but let me write down my favorite family of cubics, because I always think, I always think in movement. And this family of cubics, uh, well, I'm I'll write it naively uh, with just uh, one parameter, t, z. Actually, I'm going to change to make that parameter projective in a minute. But I look at a Fermat cubic. I look at a Fermat cubic. And for some reason, I always never look at things isolated. I like to see them moving. And I move it by adding, uh, by adding this thing. Uh, that's not my idea. <laughs> this is, uh, I think, called the Hesse family. I, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure this is what it's called, but I, I'm very bad with names, so I, I may have to correct it. Okay, it doesn't matter. This is, you have the Fermat cubic, and you, you move it. And you got different ones. And they really are different. Point being that GL3 here acts, and you will see that most of these are, maybe some are equivalent in this family. I think there's a finite group here that matters. But, but most of them are inequivalent okay, by GL3. So it's an interesting 
one parameter family of cubic. The way I formulated it is T is in a complex is a complex number, so it's not compact. So actually, I should have a projective family here. Uh, so I should allow T uh, equal to infinity should be allowed, and I'll have to say what that means. <clears throat> okay, but let's let's just take T equal to zero. And I'm going to do another thing here. Uh, now, uh, let me just see here. Uh, this is going to, I'm going to take a base point up here. Uh, and my picture is going to, I, some people who, one, I don't know. You will look at pictures, uh, you all uh, can look on the internet, and pe but people, what they do, they make pictures over the real numbers that are wrong. I mean, <laughs> over the reals they're right, but uh, they, they bad intuition. So anyway, this is C. This is probably wrong. So uh, if you take a line through a point, a generic line, okay, I don't know. Um, so this is C, this cubic curve, and it should take a, a point P0 outside as base point, and it intersects in three points. Okay? Now there's a problem. The problem is, <laughs> this problem is an obvious one, uh, <laughs> is this problem. Everything, everything, Uh, so it's actually, I mean, C is the curve at... Uh... C is the cubic, is the cubic curve. So, and let's, let's say, take a good one of the mock curve. But then okay. why does it intersect then? So now it intersects... A line, a cubic intersects a line in three points. But now it's four. Oh, it's did I draw four? Well, P itself is on there. You know, this one underneath. <laughs> uh, one, two, three. <laughs> but P itself is not... Oh, it's not on the curve. Yeah. No, no, no. no. This, I, 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 I didn't oh. say that clearly enough. Okay. I, I, I probably could do something on the curve. Yeah. In fact, I know I can, but... I want to introduce another method. Okay. <laughs> so take P off the curve. Okay. Look at the family of lines okay. through the. And then take the I don't know how to draw this thing. So, but it, what, generically, it intersects in three points. Okay. Okay. And, and then there's a major problem there because uh, you see this double point here was really uh, no, harmless because uh, somehow everything analytically continued through this. But this. This, this is uh, some terrible point that I need to worry about. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at that. So, um, uh, so this is uh, Z cubed plus Z1 cubed plus Z2 cubed. <clears throat> and, and let's take a point not on the line, which is say one, not on the cubic, one, zero, zero. Okay. And let us take, uh, let us write down this line. Okay. And let us intersect. With the cube. Now, uh, if we have some point on this line, uh, which uh, which is uh, what's going on here? I don't know. Let's let's write this thing as uh, a zero b zero. No, a zero a one a two. Maybe this is the point uh, a. Um, then this line is, I hope, something like a homotopy. Uh, the general point on this line, I hope, let's see if we agree with this, uh, will be uh, uh, zeta times p. You see, I make a mistake. Zeta, let, let's call this point A, the general point A. So it will be zeta times p0 plus 1 minus zeta 
zeta 0 p 0 times zeta 1 a. Mm -hmm. um, where zeta uh, zeta 0 zeta 1 1 is a point in p 1. So it seems to me that that's the way to think about a line. You take two points, it's parameterized by p1, and so here's the parameterization. So uh, if I write this down in coordinates, that is zeta 0 at the first thing, uh, zeta 1, uh, uh, oh, terrible, zeta 0, zeta zero plus uh, zeta 1, a, ah, zeta, now here there's no zero, so zeta, there's no, yeah, zeta one, zeta, any one, zeta one, a two, right? Huh? Okay, that's terrible. Uh, let's see what happens here. I want to put that in, uh, where, where does that intersect this, uh, this thing? So uh, what are we doing here? Zeta 1 is not equal to 0, we can assume. So, uh, but if zeta 1 is equal to 0, then then we're at P0. And P0 is not in the curve, so we can divide. And so this, uh, I'll divide. Zeta 0 plus zeta 1 A0, A1, A2. That's good. And basically, uh, this can be anything. You divide it by zeta 1. Okay, zeta 1. I'm sorry, thank you. I'm, uh, thanks, Kevin. I always make stupid mistakes, right? So that's now correct. Right? That's now correct. And this thing could be anything. Right? So I'll call it T. Okay, well, that's not the Better call that S. So S, A1, A2. Okay. Okay. Now I put it in the equation. So it's s cubed uh, plus uh, a one cubed plus a two cubed equals zero. Okay. Does it have it has multiplicity true? What? What? I mean, that point, that point is on the curve, but it has multiplicity 3. Maybe. It, yeah, if it's going to be a bad point, it has multiplicity 3. And multiplicity 3 means that... Uh, so multiplicity 3 means... means that this is 0. This is the same thing as this thing being 0. And this is the same thing, what well, means multiplicity equals 3. Right? So, I hope I get this right. A2, I'm sorry. A2. Okay. So you're not considering the general hyper family now. Hmm? I mean, you're just focusing on the Fermat here. I mean, sure. I don't, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just on the Fermat here. Now, let's check what I've done here. Probably something stupid. Let's see what happens. Let's go through it again. So, I'm interested when this thing is tangent. Right? So, I'm interested when it intersects in less than three points. Right? Right? That's the... Right. So... I take a point. Okay, well that's uh, I take a point, any point on this curve, say which is which is not of this type, and I want to understand this point here where it could be tangent. So when you take that point A, it's in P2. The yeah. point A is in P2. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. This this point should be, yes? Can you, can you please explain a bit more why that? What? Why, why that is the formula for a line in P two? 
I just wrote down the formula for a line of B2. Yeah, a line in B2, yeah, no, let's discuss this. A line in B2 is determined by two points. So I look, I want to parameterize that line by P1. Okay? And I just did it. So it's the same thing like in the reals, like DM yeah, moments? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same thing. You just check that this is a, uh, an algebraic isomorphism of P1 onto this line. So this is zeta 0 times that, zeta 1 times that. Okay, here we go. Good. So, good. Uh, okay, so this, this point, this is the general point. So let's call it, this is the point, P, let's say this is the point we're trying to understand, P1. Okay. And now we determine for multiplicity a1 squared cube plus a2 cube has to be zero. Okay. So what does this say? So there are three possibilities. Hmm? So for the Okay, so this says the ratio. Okay, this thing's gonna be on the curve. So these two these things are zero. Right? Yeah. And this has to lie on the curve. Well, I mean, it just says these things. These things are uh, okay. I don't know. Let's 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 write this. I, I'm going to write this really stupidly. Okay. It has to lie on the curve. So this is I'm being really silly here. Since we're experimenting, it's good. Right. Equals zero. But we know that we have this condition for ramification, right? So this is this is zero. So it says that this first coordinate has to be zero. Okay, so this thing is equal. Uh, I think I got this right. All right, so f is zero because. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if that equation is satisfied, s must be zero, right? That's so, right. So, so the first coordinate is zero, and then you have the ratio of a1 over a2. I mean, it can be two different numbers, right? Roots of unity, essentially, zero of unity. So I guess like you get three points. Well, so from that equation, from s, from the last cubic equation that you wrote, you're stating because it's tangent. Which it's equation are you? Uh, the the one that starts with s. Yeah. Because it's a tangent point, mm -hmm. then it has to have at least the multiplicity, like multiplicity. That's right. Too. That's right. Because it has multiplicity, and that's a complex number, a1 to the cube plus a2 to the cube has to be zero, and then you go back and multiplicity has to be three. That's right. I mean that's what you do, no? That's uh that's yeah, this I mean yeah. the reason it does the that sum is zero is because it has a multiplicity because it's tangent. Right. So, so the point is here, okay, I'm going to write it here. I, I, there's so many letters on this board. This is really an experimental didactic here. But this is the general point, and we know V1, this is what you're saying, uh, Mihai, right? Right? Um, I mean, we proved that. Yes. We, we proved it. We proved that. Yeah, we proved that. It's, but it's not cute. Mm -hmm. cube, and it's yeah. not q zero. Yeah, it's q q. But the, what, what can we say about b zero? Isn't it zero? No, b zero is zero. B zero is not. And b zero is zero, of course. Right. So what I was saying was that you can probably go a little bit further. I mean, I don't know if this is true or not, but if the sum of b one cube and b two cube is zero, right. then it means that b one over b two cube is minus one. That's good. So b1 over b2 must be a third root of minus 1. b1, or let's, let's do, this is what you're... Yeah, this is equal to minus 1. So you can sort of, so there are exactly three different possibilities here, right? Yes. So if you pass to the coordinate, the projection... Okay, so the three, three, three possibilities. Three possibilities.
Okay, let's go through the logic now. So we've done some stupid calculation before breakfast. And we go through the logic. We found three points. Right? Right there. Yeah. The, cube, the cube roots of minus one. To define points on the curve with, re with, uh, with ram multiplicity three. So ram ramification index two. Okay? So this is a guy, I mean, I just want to do this. Uh, <laughs> Having fun business here, and now we can really have some fun. We apply Riemann Hurwitz. Okay, let's apply Riemann Hurwitz. I've been trying to understand this curve, and I try to understand by projection on P1. And now I found projection on the P1. Not only did I find it, with your help, I found, what did you tell me, three ramifications? Three found three ramification points So that thing looks like the plane hmm? It looks like the plane It looks like C No, everything's compact and nothing looks like C Well, the curve is called C, but <laughs> not the numbers. Okay. Well, but the Euler number is, is. Let's look. So we found a, a three to one ramified cover over P one. Right. And actually, I can even draw it. Right? Right, so there's three ramification points for P1. And now, what is the statement? The topological order character the number of C is three times the topological Euler number of P1, everybody knows that. That's six, minus uh, the ramification order here is two, so that's two, 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 minus six. So this thing is equal to zero. We know this is equal to two minus two G. So this is a Riemann surface of genus zero. And it says, that, uh, huh, a one. And this says that C is a, is a torus. Okay. If it's a Fermat curve. Okay. So I really, uh, uh, we could probably not generalize this and get a little dirty if this is an arbitrary cubic, right? <laughs> get a little bit dirty. In the, in the Hesse family, it's not difficult to do it because it's so. It's just this elementary. On well, the torus, which are the three points that are bad? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm going to tell you this map now. And Meierstrasse is all about it. So let me tell, I'm going to shift now. This is beautiful, right? I mean, the, <laughs> you know, when you first see this, you have an algebraic equation of degree three. And suddenly it's a torus. Very exciting. I'm going to shift to analytic viewpoint now. And maybe we will see more easily what, what's going on here from an analytic viewpoint. So analytic viewpoint. everything I can get my hands on in mathematics. I don't have, I'm not pure at all. So I like to look at it also. So we found out this was a torus. Well, if we believe that genus 1 means it's a torus. You see, a statement that it's a torus is a statement 
and it's a lattice, C modulo a lattice. And there's a huge, there's a huge gap here. This is a theorem that a genus G equals zero implies Taurus is really a very non-trivial theorem that I will discuss. One. G equals four. Huh? G equals one. How is my, you know, I take the logarithm. <laughs> <laughs> It's terrible. I don't know the difference. I, but it's the point I'd rather think additively. <laughs> okay, I'm terrible. Sorry. So, I only a viewpoint. Let's accept this theorem that G equals 1 means Taurus. I will prove it later on. But let's look at Weierstrass's viewpoint here. So, Weierstrass considers a lattice in the complex numbers. Not only by your straps, but many people consider a lattice in the complex numbers. Now a lattice is, is generated by two elements over the integer. Not canonically. You have a basis of, of this free abelian group rank two. So one often draws a picture like that. And then one has all of these things. Here's omega 1, 2, two and so on. And one somehow, uh, again, my granddaughter can understand identifying opposite sides and so on. So that, it, that the torus x would be C modulo of this lattice really does look like the torus. I'm not sure what Weierstrass understood geometrically, but he was interested in multiply periodic functions and using them to solve differential equations, for example. So Weierstrass wrote down a function which he called sigma of z, and this function will, it will be, if you understand some slightly more general theory will be the first theta function you ever look at. <clears throat> this function, you know it from cal uh, calculus or one, uh, one complex variable, is supposed to vanish. It is a good function vanishing exactly on the lattice. Keep in mind, I'm trying to build a, a periodic function. <laughs> the best I can do at first is just build one that, a function that vanishes at, is periodic on the zeros. Okay? You know there will never be a holomorphic periodic function. Because if there is a holomorphic periodic function, it's, it's defined here. Right? And this is compact. So it, there's no such thing. I mean, by periodic. Uh, in this case, I said multiple, you know, I jumped. Yeah. But, but, yeah, it's, yeah. double periodic. So, but Weierstrass is not stupid. He knows this, of course. And, and so he writes down a, fu a function. The notation of Weierstrass, he puts a prime on the lattice. That means uh, he worries about uh, uh, the zero element he wants to take out front. And that corresponds to putting Z here. And, and of course, this is Weierstrass function. This does not converge. But if you think a little bit and you put a certain appropriate quadratic polynomial here, you think it was a weight function. If you want to be phys physical in your consideration, put minus here. <laughs> okay. This weight function will kill off the, the uh, you choose the right weight function. But how do, how do you put omega below this? Huh? Can it be zero? I told you, this, that prime means it's not allowed to be zero. Oh, okay. 
And, and the, yeah, of course, you want the zero to be a zero of this function, because right, so you just take that outside. Okay. It's just okay. no. that's the way Vastra, a prime year Vastra uses. Mm -hmm. Then you, this doesn't converge, but you put some weight function here. Actually, you, there's a canonical way of choosing it. Uh, if you would uh, read a beautiful chapter in the book of Alphors, you would see all about this. It's, it's, it's very gorgeous. I recommend it. So this is a certain quadratic rate function. This, this function is not periodic. Of course not. It could, so. But Meierstrauss is courageous. <laughs> he, he sees what happened. Well, due to this weight function being quadratic, this is e to an affine function uh, of z times sigma z. It is, it is not periodic, but it transforms uh, by e to some affine function. You understand what I mean? It's, I mean uh, 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 affine linear function. Let me just make sure you understand what I mean. A omega z, depending on omega. This is the transformation rule for a theta function. The study of theta functions is extremely important in all forms of mathematics. Number theory, analysis, physics, applied science, engineering. Well, <laughs> you guys are not stupid. You want to kill this thing. And so what you do, you say, let's take a log of this thing. Well, log of this thing, uh, I told you, I'd rather think additively. <laughs> this log brings this thing down, right? That says, uh, this log of this thing transforms like an affine... But you think locally. No. Huh? Everything is global here. It's global. But can you define the logarithm here? Well, first of all, you shouldn't worry. <laughs> One reason you shouldn't worry is, you're right, it's local. Because this thing vanishes and you're a little bit worried about the zeros and you're going around and all this stuff. But it's well defined up to some uh, period of the logarithm. And anyway, I, I, what I get is this affine thing here, so I'm going to kill it by differentiating. So this thing, when I differentiate it, it kills uh, this term and kills the b. This this thing here transforms by a constant, right? And now your worries about the logarithm are gone because it's a logarithmic derivative of something. It's, there's no problem, right? F prime over F. So this is gone. This is meromorphic, of course, now. Already we've got, we've got in poles because, yeah. but we still have a bad transformation rule. And so you take the second derivative, and this thing is periodic. And to get things the way you like, you take the sign. Very, very canonical construction, don't you? Well, the signs in the hand are canonical. Why do you put the minus there? Because you wanted to have a pole of order 2, which looks like 1 over z squared instead of minus 1 over z squared. You see, you see what I mean? Right. Um, OK, so this thing, now you write the Laurent series for this thing. It's trivial to write the Laurent series for this thing. It has a pole of order 2 here plus higher order terms. So you start with a theta type function. I'm going to change this. Let me just call this a, a, a theta, theta. I may be mixing notations here. But now we're in a standard situation, which is even true in higher dimensions. And taking this thing, we got this so-called Weierstrass p function. This thing converges. Uh, you can write it down. This is 1 over z plus sum. Now we write down the, the sum because we log omega and gamma prime of uh, z. Oh, sorry, 1 over z minus omega squared minus 1 over omega squared. This is the effect of the convergence factor. What's with you behind? 
And don't you see how you got that? Well, uh, it takes half a day. <laughs> no, it's a direct calculation. What, what, it's really a direct calculation. Okay? And the reason you don't see this is I haven't told you what that quadratic point yeah. is. But this is, this is easy to see. You take a formal logarithm of that, of that product, and you see what you need to force conversions of that logarithm, and, you, and the logarithm has a Taylor series, and you just kill off enough to do it, and you only need a quadratic polynomial. This is standard construction, uh, which is very beautiful. So this is a meromorphic function, <laughs> and this maps, you will love this, on the P2, on the P1, right? It's a meromorphic function. It's a mapping on the P1. Who's X? Hmm? Who's X? Is the torus? The, the, the torus. Maybe I should, yeah. Then. Let's write a C map. Okay. Okay. And you ask yourself, how many poles does it have? <laughs> well, <laughs> the only pole that it has, well, here's the pole is equal zero, and here are the poles along the lattice, but that's one point in the torus. So it has one pole, namely the origin. So if this is a, this is a zero in, in, C, in, in this group, uh, this has a pole, and, and this is infinity here in P1. Uh, and this zero goes on to here, and it's a pole of order two, so it looks like that. Okay. That's what God only knows, and then you have to work. Well, you know, the genus upstairs is what? One. I'll get it right. <laughs> Good. Okay. Genus upstairs equals uh, is one. Is one? Yes. And it's two to one. It's two times the genus downstairs. Uh, oh, that's four. That's four. Huh? I need four no, ramifications. Two is equal to ah. minus one minus one. Huh? And it's the other way around. Okay, here's P1. No, you put the, the, the genuses in their own places. <laughs> it's two times one minus one. What's the genus of P1? Zero. Uh, yeah, but I mean, what's the Euler number? So the topolo topological Euler number is zero. Yes. I, you put the, I, I yeah. forgot to even do that. The top, I'm calculating topological Euler number upstairs is equal to 2 times the topological Euler number downstairs minus 4. Okay? So this is a 2 to 1 ramified cover with 4, 1, 2, 3, uh, 4 ramifications. No choice. Guess what this map is? This map is the stupidest map you can think of. It is the quotient of the torus by the equivalence relation z equivalent to minus z. You see, this, this mapping is this this five plus b function is is periodic. You, you can see it, it's, it's independent. Yeah. You put in minus here and look what happens. It's really periodic, I mean, with respect to z minus z. And that's exactly what this is. This is exactly this map. And so you can really see what the fixed points are if you take the lattice here, omega 1, omega 2, this beautiful theory. One of them is 0. Another one is half lattice element, where is a fixed point of this z goes to minus z. This other half lattice point, and then the sum of the two half lattice points. So if you want to choose lattice points, this would be zero, this would be half lattice point, this would be another half lattice point, and this would be uh, the sum of half lattice point. Yeah, you can analyze it like this. Yeah, but why, so you, you better afford ramification points, why, why aren't they one point that there are three points, but one has a it's ramified in three way, in three branches. Because it's just a two to one covering, that's right. That's right. Because you have no choice. I, he, he, you understand what he's saying. I mean you look at higher order ramification, there's no possibility. That's what you're saying. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. So 
Absolutely. Uh, that's forced by the full insert. That's right. That's right. You guys don't have a higher qualification. You're giving a proof. Yeah. Okay. Well, this mapping here was three to one, remember? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this function is two to one. And you know, we can take its derivative. And if we take its derivative, we get a polar order three. And you can check that that's precisely such a thing. I don't know if the numbers are exactly right, but in this Fermat thing, it will be exactly the same. So, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't do this analytic side, but I love it so much I'm forced to do it. comment if you find this beautiful uh, I would I would recommend you make one more step here <laughs> what's the group acting on P1 the group uh, you all know this the so-called what do they call them Mobius transformations Mobius transformations those are the linear transformations the GL2 or something PGL. PGL2 and you all know it's very convenient. You can move any three points in the normal form, right? Uh, now we've already got one point here in normal form, right? That's, that's, I like zero, one, and infinity as the normal form points. So we can always call this point zero, and always call this point one, and everything is now somehow rigidified. We don't have any freedom of the, of the symmetry. So we have a somehow moving point. So for various tori, remember, we have this different lattices. You all know that for different lattices, generally speaking, you get different tori. And you want to parameterize this tori, these tori, and this parameter is going to be very close to parameterizing these tori. This parameter, a Weierstrass called this lambda always. And this parameterization is very close to that parameterization that you see up there with T. So there are all sorts of beautiful things to consider here. But at least you see that as you vary the lattice, you're certainly going to vary this function. And you're going to, you see the horrible variation here. Yeah? But what is, what is what is the reason for it? Like the lattice has two, de two degrees of freedom and you have only one degree of freedom. Yeah, that's a very good point. You have <laughs> the action of <clears throat> GL1C on the complex plane. So this, right, I mean, it's C star. Mm -hmm. Yeah, C star. So uh, this, uh, this maps the lattice into other lattices, but they're equivalent, certainly, in every regard on this discussion. So you can move you only, one. You only, it's only the, so, the, the angle between them? Sometimes. Well, I think we, what we like to think of quite often, for example, would be something like this, right? Yeah, the angle. Yeah. Well, this, of course, has a length, too. But uh, yeah, yeah that, that's the way you should think. In a complex sense, it's that. So what we quite often do is we, we say, well, we can put the first one as one. And actually, you can think about it a, bit, a little bit, and the second one you can put in the upper half plane, we always call it tau. And to every tau, you get a torus. And this is almost a parameterization. But you will check that uh, if you take tau plus one here, of course, it's the same lattice, <laughs> right? And so the action of SL2Z on the other upper half plane is what you really have to mile by. 
but it's more or less just this talent. Okay? Now, as I said, even in an elementary way, Althaus has written this really in a sweet chapter in his book I like very much. You can read about it. It's very nice. Okay, so what we do here is we go to the derivative of the Weierstrass p function. And, and this uh, defines a 3 to 1 ramified cover. And Alphors, uh, Alphors, uh, <laughs> Weierstrass was uh, certainly a, a man who thought in affine sense and was very interested in, in the complex plane and so he really was interested projectively and he wrote down the differential equation easily you can easily do this uh, I just happen to remember the number four there it's not, it's not of any relevance and I don't remember exactly the science here and I don't remember his letters but they're either big G or little g and they're explicitly computable in terms of the lattice. Okay? In terms of series in the lattice elements, which are called Eisenstein series. So this, this is the differential equation of alpha, of Weierstrass. And then Weierstrass says, well, what the heck? I'm going to consider the mapping into C2, must be a little <laughs> worried about being monomorphic, namely, uh, Z goes to, um, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, uh, maybe P will prime, let's put the prime in a second. Why do we worry about this? There's a pole. So what I've written down here, the origin now goes to infinity in some sense. So you don't want to have P1 to... Well, what I want to do now... Is it the, it's a well-defined function of P1 to... So I'm going to consider it like this. And then recall that then the pole, which is where, where is the pole? It's zero. Right? Mm -hmm. The pole is zero. The pole will be going somehow to infinity in this P2. So we write this as homogeneous coordinates 1, P, uh, Z, P prime of Z, right? In P2. And we remember in our coordinatization, this is uh, uh, this is what I want to dehomogenize this equation now. So the equation that we get, I just told you, was z to uh, this thing squared equals. Okay, I'll write it down just for fun. For uh, this thing q plus g1, this thing, plus g2, this thing. And then our two denominators to get a homogeneous polynomial, and I get then z2 squared z0, plus 4 z, uh, what is it Why do you want to put g2 by the last thing? Huh? What? Why do you want to put g2 by the last thing? Because, oh, because I'm an idiot. That's, that's, I just get carried away with writing this. <laughs> yeah? Okay, so, uh, yeah, right? This brings us over on the other side. So I clear denominators. I get a z, z0 here. I get nothing here, so that's z1 cubed. Uh, uh, I don't know, minus. I, I think I should put a minus here. You'd love it. Um, what do I hear here? Uh, uh, Z1, Z0, Z0. Let's leave it. Let's leave it. 
minus uh, z1, z0 square, z1, z0 square, z2, z0 cube. Okay? Yeah. And that is what people call the Weierstrass canonical or normal form of a cubic curve. <laughs> and it, arri it arises just because of this entire analytic discussion. So this is not at all the same as in the Hesse family, but it is then, you can see, but in all tori in some sense. Can you use an element of GL3 to make it look nicer? Yes. That's very interesting. Yeah. This is a very interesting thing to do. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that people did in the late 19th century. It was really trying to find these normal forms by putting in linear transformations. Okay. Weierstrass comes from this with an incredible analytic consideration, right? <laughs> some of the people. Okay, so in some sense, this is a discourse on quadrics and cubics. And then in the afternoon, I will, I will go higher. I won't just do quadrics. Uh, uh, I will talk about, my goal this afternoon is to talk about curves in general and then to prove the genus formula, which I have told you what it is. And of course, what I've done here is a special case of the genus formula. Okay? So that's what I'll do this afternoon. So I, I find that incredibly beautiful formula. And these are the degree of the well, the polynomial is polynomial. But, yeah. You take a homogeneous polynomial at degree d. Of course, you want to make sure the curve is smooth. And then that's the genus. It's incredible. So is it possible to classify the cubic as well? Yes. So cubic, I think the cubic, so cubic is very, very well understood. Um, because of the phenomena like this. Right. At least of one class. But uh, what Kayvon is asking, uh, you can answer in many ways. He says, is it possible to classify the cubics? One answer is, does, does every Riemann surface of genus zero, is it realizable as a, a cubic? This is the first thing. Uh, genus one. One. I logged I again. <laughs> genus one. And then, then you have this, this uh, sort of correspondence between lattices and, and cubic. Right. So it's a question, I mean, in your situation with discrete groups in this thing, I mean, you're going to say, I classify them by upper half plane modulo SL2Z and very classical functions such as Jacobi uh, function and so on. That's sort of the analytic classification. Very nice. Another classification, what Mihai wants to do, which is a very reasonable thing, take all the cubic curves <laughs> and just mod out by the action of GL3. And uh, this is a very good thing to do also. But it's actually not, it's very tricky. Because some of the cubic curves are singular. You have to keep this in mind. So, I mean, I hate to bother you with a this stupid cubic curve, but it's, it's always this problem. You have this uh, singular cubic curve, and you have various other singular cubic curves, which get involved in Mihai's discussion, because when he's just buying out, he, it's very hard for him to differentiate between smooth curve and okay. Okay. But I mean, any mod out. I mean, smooth curves. Would, I mean. So I, then you have to say good curves. You want to mod out the good curves. Right. right. And then this is already modern mathematics. So this is Mumford's notion of semi-stability. So you mod out the semi-stable curve or the stable curve. So you're semi-stable. Okay. And then you're more or less happy, but then you have to do some calculations, so it's invariant theory. And then somehow you come back to the Jacobi invariant. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter. It's, so, it's the only invariant. Somehow, I'm, I'm thinking high level here, but somehow this number is, is going to end up being the only invariant. has to be. But you may realize it by Mihai's idea or by your idea. And that's the beauty of it, right? I mean, this algebraic group idea and the analytic idea is gorgeous. And I guarantee you, this is the heart of modern IT technology. 
double mobile, what is it called? Information technology, so I said it twice. IT, IT security. So you know, all of all these cards that we have are the, the, the security on these cards is due to elliptic curves over finite fields. Okay. So I'll talk about that.